Bill Baruch, president of Blue Line Futures, joins us this morning. Bill, welcome. Let's just pick up where we left off. We were talking about crude, the uh, Treasury's yields here in the U.S. I guess I'm wondering, would you agree a breakout uh, to the upside? Would that pose a headwind for stocks or are they resilient enough to shrug that off as well? Yeah, I, I don't know if there's any other new news coming out right now, but like clockwork, you got the U.S. 10-year yield moving above 4%, and we're getting a little bit of weakness across the board in risk assets. Equity markets are just kind of ticking down. We're seeing currencies against the U.S. dollar ticking down. The U.S. dollar itself is, is moving higher. So very interesting, uh, you know, across the board here as we get the uh, month going. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, we heard from the RBA, looks like they went ahead, left rates on change, 4.1%, I guess. Some were calling for a quarter percent rate hike there. Raise a little bit of question in terms of the Bank of England later this week, whether we'd see 25 or um, some were calling for 50 even as, as high as uh, for the BOE. Yeah, that's another interesting thing too. The, the uh, RBA left rates unchanged but they did talk about more tightening likely necessary in the future. And that's something to kind of lean on. But but the Aussie dollar is is pretty significantly lower here today with the broad uh, you know, weakness with the Chinese surprise of that private Chinese uh, manufacturing survey uh, contracting below 50. Leaving rates unchanged uh, for the first consecutive meeting since March, April of last year and inflation eased to 6% in the, uh, for the year into June. For the June numbers, I should say, down from the December peak that we saw up around 7.8%, still above their target, that band they have 2 to 3%. Talk to us a little bit about some of the overnight data. Anything stand out in terms of China? I saw uh, the uh, manufacturing number, it looks like. I saw Hong Kong retail sales. A bit of a disappointment across the board, kind of, I guess one could argue, just in line with the trend we've been seeing, Bill. Yeah, that that uh, Caxon private survey, which I just spoke with the uh, tied to the Aussie dollar mm -hmm. a bit, uh, that was definitely a surprise. It contracted. They were looking for that to be above 50. That uh, that was a surprise. However, you know, over, earlier this morning, the unemployment data from Germany was a bit better than expected too. So a little mix there, but it, it really from the China survey uh, and then some of the the RBA holding tight more just to to monitor and kind of see what the previous rate hikes have have done uh, just alludes to this the ongoing weakness in Asia. Now, I, I'm not sitting here very negative on China. I think if anything, uh, you know, we're, we're in a you know, I don't think it get much worse than this. But uh, I was I was, to be honest, expecting a bit better from that that private survey. I thought that private survey would show a bit better than the, the uh, state survey, which was on uh, on Sunday night that it, it, all, it too contracted, but was a touch better than expected. China, definitely uh, the missing link, right? One could argue a corner piece in this puzzle in terms of getting that bigger picture right now. We're still kind of waiting for a little bit more information there. Uh, let's yeah. talk a little bit more uh, specifically about some of these individual currencies. We could begin with the U.S. dollar at 102. You mentioned 10-year yields inching their way up. We've seen the dollar recovering from those 15-month lows. Um, I guess I'm kind of wondering, as we see central bankers sort of working their way away from this hike uh, aggressively policy and something a little bit more uh, neutral, ultimately, uh, does the dollar just kind of get looked at as the driest towel on the rack as the dust settles from this uh, aggressive stance that we've seen? I mean, the U.S. economy is is moving along pretty well. I think what, what's the Atlanta Fed GDP now look? I think it's three and a half percent. Now that's a very early look, but um, you know, I I think that we're we're potentially, you know, obviously the 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 best house in the bad block, but okay. but but. I, I wouldn't even go that far. I would say that we're we're actually, you know, I mean, there's we're not in a soft landing camp here. We're we're in the no landing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some some of the data can really slow. That's what I'm gonna look out for. I, I think the next month or two is gonna be pretty pivotal. I, we have a lot of data coming out this week. ISM survey uh, for manufacturing today. Then as we move through the week, we have jobs and in, in, in the ISM services as well. And then finishing out with non-farm, but. Um, you know, right here, right now, I mean, before getting this slate of data, I mean, you have to think that we're, we're in a no landing zone and uh, this the, the U.S. economy is looking pretty solid. Um, now, my fear for the markets within that would be the fact that it, it means that rates need to go a little bit higher from here. That's going to tighten conditions and, and um you know, that's going to potentially, you know, be a, be a little bit of a headwind to the risk market, be a headwind to the equity markets. Uh, so that's what I'm looking at right now. And we're seeing a 20 percent probability the Fed hikes rates at their uh, September meeting. We'll get we'll get news later this month from Jackson Hole as this data comes out. But uh, I, my again, my fear would be that tw a 20 percent chance of a hike 
September might be a bit low. Uh, if the data continues to be, you know, that needs to at least be a 50-50. And in order to get there, we're going to have to see rates higher, and, and likely that's going to, again, it's going to tighten up the risk environment. Uh, you know, you mentioned the RBA, right, or the Aussie dollar, I should say, Asia-Pacific currencies. A minute ago, we were talking about the Canadian dollar and that disconnect between crude oil, our neighbors to the north, our neighbors to the south, for that matter, as well, the peso, uh, briefly. Talk to me a little bit about uh, European currencies in terms of what to watch. Obviously, you have the Bank of England, again, as we pointed to on Thursday, but a little bit of a different stance here, a bit more aggressive stance here, possibly from the EU, should the data support it, but also a very... Uh, uh, um, um, keeping their options open, I guess, is the best way to put it in terms of Christine Lagarde's last comments. Yeah, I, I think they're at a pivotal you know, inflection point as well. I mean, we've seen we've seen inflation off the worst levels, but it's still lingering pretty high. So it's going to be interesting to see, too, where, where that data takes us in the coming weeks. Uh, you mentioned the Canadian dollar, something there, uh, you know, th that reversal from, from yesterday's strength and, and not really following crude oil higher. That's got me pretty interested. And I actually uh, entered into a put position today for our CTA that, that we run uh, and, and looking at some some potential downside there uh, in the very near term. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I think with the dollar index moving back above 102, it's going to be interesting to see just, just some, maybe some risk premium coming out of some of the other currencies from, from the recent move here in the past few weeks. Yeah, we talked about this being a key area right now in terms of a prior area support. If we were to take out this 102 area, building momentum to the upside here uh, could open up the door for potential gains. And interestingly enough, uh, it would be key to watch rates if that continues as well. Bill, appreciate you joining us to talk financial markets this morning. The president of Blue Line Futures.